Good morning and welcome to Farm Factor. I'm your host, Jamie Bloom. Up first today, Kyle Bauer visits with Robert Atchison with the Kansas Forestry Service. Then enjoy this week's Kansas Soybean Update. Next, Dwayne Taves catches up with Kate Hall with GMO Answers. Then Clint Mefford reports on whether cow-calf producers should keep replacement heifers or buy bred females. We'll end with this week's Plain Talk. Stay with us. Closed captioning brought to you by Ag Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at agpromosource.com. This segment brought to you by Kansas Grain Sorghum, growers working together. Find out more at kansasgrainsorghum.org. Welcome to Farm Factor. Let's join Kyle and Robert Atchison as they discuss agroforestry, integrating the use of trees and shrubs into modern agricultural systems. Hi, this is Kyle Bauer visiting with Robert Atchison. He is with the Kansas Forestry Service. Um, Bob, explain to the viewers um, who the Kansas Forestry Service is. Um, we're, uh, we're a state agency that's housed within uh, the Department of, uh, well, actually within the College of Agriculture at Kansas State University. And uh, we uh, provide public service to the people of the state. Uh, in a variety of ways, and uh, the particular area that I work in is uh, within our rural forestry programs. So we're, uh, we're working with uh, farmers and ranchers throughout the state and other landowners to uh, help them manage their woodlands and their shelter belts and uh, provide uh, professional forestry advice in the way they do that. Well, and I know it, this isn't the first time you heard it, but you think about Kansas and forests, it's an oxymoron. Right, yeah. It's, uh, it's an interesting place to practice forestry, and a lot of what we do here is what you would describe as agroforestry, where we're using trees and shrubs uh, integrated into uh, to modern agricultural systems uh, so, that, so that we get both conservation benefits as well as uh, production benefits. Uh, for uh, for our farmers and ranchers and truly um, by doing that you provide on both ends both getting stuff planned planted and harvested yeah we do we do it from start to finish and uh, we try to always provide um, our professional knowledge and match that with what the objectives are of the particular landowner some may just be interested in wildlife <laughs> Uh, some in the northeast and the eastern part of the state may be interested in timber harvest. Um, a lot of people uh, are interested in recreation. And so uh, we can actually manage our woodlands and our shelter belts uh, based upon what, whatever that particular desire and interest of that landowner is. And a lot of times there will be multiple interests and objectives that a landowner will have. You have a few times there's fees, but most of this the fee is minimal. Yeah, we don't charge for our services. Um, we, uh, we also work on behalf of uh, the Natural Resource Conservation Service as uh, kind of a technical service provider. Uh, and, uh, and so what that enables us to do is to uh, funnel uh, financial assistance uh, to help uh, farmers and ranchers and landowners uh, who might want to plant trees or uh, establish a shelter belt or uh, do water quality work uh, by establishing uh, trees along a stream side. Uh, one last thing quickly, you grow and sell a lot of trees every year. We do, um, around 300 to 400,000 depending upon the year. And uh, those trees go throughout the state to, uh, to plant new shelter belts. And uh, more and more we're seeing uh, trees that are going uh, uh, along our rivers and our streams uh, to try to stabilize those stream banks uh, because of the uh, significant water issues we have in this state. Um, and we're, we want to stabilize those stream banks, keep the soil there and not, not, in, our, uh, not in our reservoirs where, where we're losing water capacity. We're visiting with Robert Atchison. He is with the Kansas Forestry Service. This is Kyle Bauer reporting. Back to you, Jamie. Thanks, Kyle. Folks, come back after these messages for this week's Kansas Soybean Update.
to see this show and past episodes of Ag AM in Kansas, go online to agamincansas.com. KFRM is one of the largest farm radio stations in the nation, dedicated to informing and entertaining rural listeners from northern Oklahoma to southwestern Nebraska. You can catch KFRM in many ways. Of course, 550 on the AM dial, streaming at kfrm.com, or on your smartphone by going to the TuneIn Radio app, or on Ag AM in Kansas on Tuesdays and Facebook every day of the week. KFRM, tune us in. You'll be glad you did. Valley Vet Supply is devoted to providing information and professional quality products at reasonable prices. ValleyVet.com, ValleyVet.com, ValleyVet Supply. This segment is brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. Welcome back to Farm Factor and the Kansas Soybean Update. This is the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. Jay O'Neill, senior ag economist with the International Grains Program at Kansas State, joins us. And Jay, there is a big partnership between IGP and the U.S. Soybean Export Council. And talk about more of the U.S. Agribusiness Partnership Program. Well, we just finished a one-week short course here at IGP in Manhattan with in cooperation with USAC. We had some of the major soybean uh, soybean meal buyers from Southeast Asia, five countries. We had uh, Thailand, Vietnam, the Philippines, India. Indonesia, Malaysia, all represented here and had a pretty good week covering a variety of topics. Such as what? Well, we covered contracting, contracting definitions and tools to use in order to make sure you get the right quality that you want in your contract when you buy from U.S. suppliers. We covered the U.S. grading system and what constitutes a number one and number two soybean and also how protein is determined and how you should contract for issues like protein and uh, even amino acids. And then we went on to discuss grain storage and uh, had a field trip out to the Lance Rezac farm in Onega, Kansas, where they got to see the soybeans that just, I think they were three weeks old, just starting to emerge and talk about the agronomic side of soybean production. And then we even had a uh, lab demo here in our BIVAP Wenger laboratory on campus. And we got to express through extrusion some full fat soybean, which was one of the other focuses of this course, to let Southeast Asian buyers know how they can produce a full fat, which is just extruding the entire full bean. So it was a pretty active week. Through this partnership between IGP and and USEC itself, do you anticipate more programs being offered like this at IGP? Oh, definitely. We do quite a variety of them. Matter of fact, right now, as we talk, there is another USEC program going on at uh, IGP. Carlos Campobadal is hosting a uh, Japan poultry nutrition. So we have some of the major Japanese poultry producers in the building this week with uh, some guest speakers from Arkansas and Florida talking uh, along with K-State presenters talking about poultry nutrition and poultry production. So we have uh, later on this year, we'll have a RAPCO, which is a USEC event, RAPCO feed manufacturing, the short course, I believe that's in August. Uh, so it just keeps, it keeps going along, yeah, which is a good thing. All right, Jay, we appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Greg, you're very welcome. Thank you. That is Jay O'Neill, Senior Ag Economist with the International Grains Program, who joins us on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. Learn more at kansassoybeans.org. For Kansas Soybeans, I'm Greg Akagi. Hope you enjoyed this week's Kansas Soybean Update. Stay with us after the break for more Farm Factor with Dwayne and Kate Hall. I will take action against herbicide-resistant weeds. I will know my weeds, and I will stop them before they go to seed. I will do whatever it takes to give my crops the upper hand. And I will use multiple herbicide sites of action because every action counts. I will take action, this time, for all time. Brown Chevrolet Buick in Wamego is driven by the spirit of American ingenuity. Come in for a new Chevrolet car, truck, or SUV. 
If we don't have exactly what you want, we'll find it for you. And we also have a great selection of used cars. We make sure you have an easy, fun, and transparent sales experience that saves you time and money. But if you want high-pressure salesmen and hours spent in the finance office, you'll just have to go elsewhere. Brown, Chevrolet, Buick, and Wamigo. We're making car buying great again. Tarwater Farm and Home has been family-owned and operated since its beginning in 1978. What you need for farm and agriculture, lawn and garden, clothing and footwear, and so much more. You'll be surprised at what you'll find in this huge store. They have what you need and lots of it. So come take a look. You'll discover that customer service is first and foremost. Always has been with the Tarwaters. Tarwater Farm and Home, 4107 North Topeka Boulevard. This segment brought to you by SureCrop. Liquid crop nutrition delivered right to your farm. We're back. Now Dwayne and Kate Hall talk about GMO Answers, an organization with answers to questions about GMOs on Facebook, Twitter, and their website, gmoanswers.com. Dwayne Thames joining you once again with Ag AM in Kansas and a chance uh, to catch up with Kate Hall talking about uh, GMOs and uh, GMO Answers, the booth that, uh, that I caught you with. And uh, certainly when we think about our urban friends, uh, there's probably more questions and, and questions that need answers. Certainly, and the question that we most often receive is just what is a GMO? Most people don't understand that a GMO is a plant that's been developed with a very specific trait, and that trait is often disease resistance, herbicide tolerance, insect resistance, to help farmers grow more crops using less inputs, which actually reduces agriculture's impact on the environment. We think about that in today's world, it's not unlike what they used to do in plant breeding a hundred years ago, it's just that the techniques that we use to do so are much different. Exactly. We're able to isolate the specific trait that we want. So instead of crossing tens of thousands of genes, we're able to take the two, three genes that code for that trait and move that into the plant we want to improve. And we think about uh, some of the things that, uh, that we are looking at and moving forward within uh, plant breeding. Uh, really, it is absolutely no introduction of anything outside. It's just a better selection process for things that are already in the DNA of those plants. Exactly. Researchers are looking for traits that they find in nature, right? They're, they're not making these up. Um, so they're, they're taking uh, uh, good traits, characteristics they find in nature to improve, again, the plants that our, our farmers grow and help feed the world. Some things that uh, will be interesting to see how they are accepted. Uh, initial traits typically were on the production side uh, for the farmer, but as we look forward, there's more and more things on the horizon that have to do with what consumers might be interested in. Absolutely. We're really excited about the innate potato. Uh, so less bruising, less browning, so it stays more appealing. Also the non-browning apple. Um, that'll be coming onto the market this year, and we're excited about that too. So when you pack those apple slices in your kids' lunches, they're less likely to throw them away. And I know that there are universities and researchers, developers, looking at enhanced nutrition. Uh, how do we uh, lessen the allergens that are in peanuts or even in wheat? So there are a lot of uses for the technology, and I think... Um, what's coming down the pike, so to speak, will benefit consumers directly, um, and in addition to the farmers. Certainly as uh, consumers uh, uh, out there that uh, really just don't have the, the best understanding of, and there's a lot of misinformation out there about uh, the mad scientist, if you will. There is, and, and it's tough to battle, um, but we also know that consumers are really interested in learning the facts, and so with GMO Answers, we're very active on social media, on Twitter, Facebook, as well as our website, gmoanswers.com. In addition to GMO Answers, there are a lot of other great resources as well, your local farm bureau, um, also USFRA, the Center for Food Integrity. Uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of organizations around in, in agriculture have stepped up over the last few years, so we're putting out much more positive, factual information information and like with you trying to get our story out to more people and ultimately we think about it uh, those farmers and ranchers out there they're feeding their own family as well exactly they wouldn't produce grow feed their family anything um, that that they would you know obviously not want to feed the public so it's also important to recognize that aspect as well the biggest thing uh, is if you have questions seek credible resources to get those answers 
Exactly. And at GMOAnswers.com, we have over 180 independent experts who are answering questions. Farmers, ranchers, organic farmers, registered uh, dietitians, nutritionists, scientists, epidemiologists. We've answered over 1,300 questions on our website. We also have our companies. We're sponsored by the large six companies, BASF, Bayer, Dow, DuPont, Pioneer, uh, Monsanto, and Syngenta. And they're answering questions specific to their business practices. People often wonder what's going on inside those companies. And and our, our organization is being very upfront and open about what we're doing. Our thanks to Kate Hall joining us with GMO Answers. Uh, for you as a consumer, you can certainly get the truthful information if you seek it out. Jamie, we'll send it back to you. Thanks, Dwayne. Come back after the break for a look at one of the hard decisions cow calf producers must make. This is Eric Stone Street. And as many of you know, I love my home state of Kansas. In March, Kansas ranchers lost homes, equipment, and thousands of cattle from the largest wildfires in the state's history. Imagine losing all you have in a fire. Not just your house, but your livelihood. Ranchers are beginning to rebuild, but it will take years and tens of millions of dollars to build back herds, fences, and other infrastructure. Today, I'm asking you to help. Donate what you can and show your support to the ranchers of Kansas. Simply go to kansasfires.com. Your donation is tax deductible and will go to those who need it the most. Grain sorghum is one of the most important cereal crops worldwide, and Kansas leads the nation in its production. Over the years, sorghum has been either exported, used in animal feed domestically, or for other industrial uses. Recently, its use in the ethanol market has seen tremendous growth, with 30% of domestic sorghum typically going to ethanol production. Kansas Grain Sorghum is committed to sorghum research, market development, and education. Learn more at ksgrainsorghum.org. Soil is the life of a farm, and for 25 years, SureCrop Liquid Crop Nutrition has helped growers produce abundant quality crops while preserving and improving the soils they steward. SureCrop offers complete soil and plant analysis with cropping recommendations, delivery direct to your on-farm storage, and quality crop nutrition custom blended for your field. Choose SureCrop for the assurance of excellence for your soil. Call today or visit their website for more information. This section Segment brought to you by Kansas Farm Bureau, the voice of agriculture. To join today or more information, go to kfb.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter. Welcome back to Farm Factor and some thoughts about whether producers should keep their replacement heifers or buy bred females. Whether to buy or keep your own heifers depends on long-term profit and matching genetics to the market, including consumer demand for beef. But that's hard to keep in mind in the short-term market. You are very much looking at, at the current situation and really open market availability and price for if you are buying replacements on the open market. But also I think even more importantly, it's looking at your own individual operation, what your cost structure are, is, what your goals are as an operation. A herd's genetic resources, or some holes pointed out by owning cattle on feed, weigh on whether to keep building from within or add an influx of new female genetics. If we are doing some retained ownership or I'm getting some of that data back through the carcasses, that helps me make some of those genetic decisions. And where you know, I see that entering really decision is to see if you know, the genetics within your own herd uh, you know, are sufficient and are allowing you to really see that progression. Or maybe you want to go outside and buy some replacement heifers to really increase some of that genetic potential. In a volatile short-term market, high-quality cattle prove their place at the top. I think you know, another attribute that, that we do see, um, you know, buyers willing to pay is, is for black Angus cattle. Um, really, that's translating to that, you know, per, for, performance that, that we've seen research on and, and that they've come to expect, as well as when we look at, at the carcass traits and, and the premiums when we get to the finished animal. A profitable cow herd does not simply maintain some positions such as the same weaning weight, the same marbling, 
or even the same marketing strategy. But I think it's always important to understand that you know we're always looking for progress, be it in management, be it in genetics, be it in marketing. So I think there's always some improvements that, that we can make. Um, and we know that markets are changing all the time. I'm Clint Mefford. Stay with us. We'll be back after these words from our sponsors with Plain Talk. Kansas Farm Bureau, the voice of agriculture, represents grassroots agriculture. The state's largest and most powerful farm organization stands up for its members through leadership development, agriculture education, legal defense, environmental advocacy, farm safety, and risk management. Members also enjoy money-saving benefits. To join our organization today or to learn more, go to www.kfb.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter. Ag Promo Source is a unique group of marketing specialists with one mission, help your ag business grow. Each affiliate has their own area of expertise and they work together to bring you advice, products, and services. To get started, visit agpromosource.com. Ag Promo Source, together we grow. I was in an accident where I fell off a roof. I don't know why I started to research stem cells, but I did. And I visited with the doctors. They were excellent. I had my neck done, my shoulders done, section of my back, my hips, my sacrum, my sciatica, and my tailbone. Now I am having better range of motion in my arms and my neck and my back. It was a long road to get there, but I'm so glad that I found them. This segment brought to you by Kansas Corn. Learn more at kscorn.com. Welcome back. Now let's see what Kyle and Duane are up to today on Plain Talk. Hi, this is Kyle Bauer with Plain Talk with Dwayne Taves. Kyle Bauer, your fact or fiction question of the day. Dogs learn by inference to voice command. Fact or fiction? As in... They learn what you mean by, like when you say, ask your dog, for instance, would you like to go for a walk? Uh -huh. Do you really think he knows what walk means? Or you... does he infer that he's about to get to go for a walk? <laughs> it's pretty deep, I know. <laughs> Don't we all live by inference? Uh, I mean, is that really a picture on the wall? Or do I? Uh, are we just inferring that's a picture on the wall? <laughs> You're looking at a different picture. Yeah, uh, I don't really know where I was going with that. But. Okay, sure, I'll go true. That's, yeah. I think everybody, everything they learn learns by what, inference. They don't really learn what the word walk means. No, they know that when they hear that. When they that, hear walk, you walk over and pick up a leash, he's going to get to go outside, and uh -huh. he's going to get to do something he enjoys. Okay, I think we all might live, live, learn by inference myself, but whatever. It's your question, not mine, yeah. but I got it right, and it's a... It's a w. w. One in the W column. Right there in the W. Uh, immigration is a big issue right now. Um, a actually, of... it's a big immigration most of my life, or big issue most of my life. Okay? All right. And um, the question is, a lot of people think we need to send a lot more people packing. Mm -hmm. Deport them, if you will. Yes. So my question to you, Dwayne Taves, is how many people about a year do we deport? I mean, because it's a big issue. There's a lot of people who thinks we should deport, deport I, more. I, I really don't have a good estimate on that. I know there. I've heard of cases where uh, people have been held at a county jail, uh, law enforcement. Out in our part of the world. And, and have been released because nobody came to pick them up to deport them. So yeah, they say, hey, I we don't, don't have a bus available. I don't think we're really deporting that many of them. I'll say... 2,500. 2,500 would be a good guess. That would be low. Um, okay, again, my most recent numbers are 2014. You like that year. Well, that's... The government the, did, The too. government likes it. By <laughs> the way, this is put out by Pew Research, so this isn't just made up by some guy in a bar. Right. Okay? 414,000. Nearly a half a million deported? Actually, and that's down 20,000 from like, the year before. Put on a plane or a bus and sent, and sent, packing. sent packing. Now, I think everybody in our part of the world thinks about Mexico sending folks back to Mexico. Right. And but there are others. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you've got, you've got the dastardly Canadians. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you, just, you just don't hear a lot about well, it. Well, and truly, 
we have a lot of people that outstay their visa. They try to get away with it. They get mm-hmm. caught. They apply for a job. They catch them. Ice shows up, and they get put on ice, if mm-hmm. you will. So cool them down. What does ice stand for? Uh, I have no. I idea. know it's the it's the ones when they have it on the back of their shirt when they come into certain places that everybody runs out the back door. <laughs> so immigration and something customs. Um, Customs. Enforcement. Enforcement. There you go. And if that's not that? it, that ought to be it. It's close enough. Thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Jamie Bloom, and I hope you enjoyed today's show. See you next week on Farm Factor. We're here every Tuesday on Ag AM in Kansas. Closed captioning brought to you by Ag Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at agpromosource.com.